fellow Olympians. <laughs> I'm pitching it at the right level, aren't I? <laughs> you know, uh, it's great to be here. And um, a physiologist once said that the problem with life is we haven't evolved yet to polish chairs. And that's the crux of the matter. Uh, and if you think about things, if we're a hundred people, we're all starving to death, and suddenly some food appears, we all fight to be in a line, and you want to be in the front of the queue, don't you? But if suddenly a bear or a lion comes through the door, then you want to be at the back of the queue, the back of the hundred people. And the responses we have to this fight or flight mechanism we have affects us in all sorts of different ways. And, and I suppose they're key to the two questions that I've got. Because we all ask ourselves these questions, and usually at an inappropriate time, or an inconvenient time as well. Um, and I'd like to share with you how it's worked in my life, because I think there's a kind of human Rubicon at work. It's a game we play, it's a game we play with other people. We laugh at in inappropriate things. And I want you to listen to what I have to say and contemplate whether or not this Rubicon is true and whether you know, there is a line that we cross that we'll never get back if we don't answer these two questions. So how did it happen to me? Well, simply, um, or going back here, I was a kind of fairly normal kid, really. Well, kind of normal anyway. Um, but I did have a sense of impending doom. And one day I was sitting in the back of a class, and the teacher walked in and said, you, read. And I went, who, me? Me? Yes, Duncan, you read. And as I was getting up, I was thinking, why me? There's all these other people in the class. Why am I having to read? And I opened the book, and I tried to read, and I was very nervous, and it all fell to pieces, went horribly wrong. And suddenly, there was a little giggle and a laugh in the class as they realized I couldn't read. It got a little worse, because um, I fell 18 feet from the tree, um, landed on the root, and as a consequence of the shock, I started to lose some hair, got some bald patches, and about eight months later, all my hair fell out. And for you wondering, I mean all my hair fell out. So, <laughs> it wasn't only Duncan the Dunce, it was bald you, Baldilocks, and you know what else. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, I'd found some reasons to look around for something positive in my life, and I think everybody around me was looking around for me. <laughs> and I found it, well, kind of. Got rid of the uh, chicken quite quickly, but fear of the shark has kept with me for years to come. Um, eventually, I did find it. I found it in a swimming class. And it was the most incredible experience, because the teacher at the end of the class said, Duncan, can you demonstrate to the class how to swim breaststroke? After what had happened, that felt good. And then at the end of the class, he, he said, Duncan, um, look, um, would you like to be part of the swim team? Oh, being part of the swim team, wow! That was really great stuff there, really fantastic. But what really changed my life was this great man. Boss, he was called. Everybody called him Boss. He founded and he was headmaster of Millfield School. Incredible man. And I went to see Boss about age 13 for an interview. And he told me I was dyslexic, which changed my life immediately, because I understood why I was having so much trouble in the classroom. He then sent me down to the pool, where I was asked to swim a four by one medley. Um, there was a problem though, I couldn't swim butterfly, uh, so I missed it out, and not being the sharpest pencil in the case, I didn't put anything in its place. I was the wrong end of the pool, yup, there's a wrong end of the pool, and there was a standoff, and eventually the coach came to the wrong end of the pool and leant over and he said, Duncan, you appear to be the wrong end of the pool, do you know why? I can't swim butterfly. My parents shrank about six inches. I tried to drown myself. <laughs> Eventually, I dragged myself out of the pool, and I was trudging up to boss's office, inspecting my shoes with great interest, totally downcast. And boss walked up. He looked at me, and he asked, 
Will he swim for the school? I looked up into Boss's eyes. He stared into my soul. And in the background, I heard the coach saying, he'll swim for the school, the county, the district, and the country. And he'll probably go beyond that. My parents had just grown one foot. And I was going, blimey, what's beyond that? He, this great man, this incredible man, had seeded the dream I was to have. He'd actually given me permission not to ask those two questions, to dream anyway. And dream I did, because about a year later, I was swimming next to an Olympian. He was just kicking, and I was swimming, and I thought, I'm going to keep up with him. <laughs> After two strokes, he kicked into the sunset, left me in a puddle of water. That night, I was sitting with two friends. There was a silence, and I suddenly went, I'm going to the Olympics. Now, I couldn't swim butterfly. I couldn't do a tumble turn, so they laughed, so I kept it to myself after that. But the, the kind of vision, the dream of the whole world competing under one roof with one common language, the common language of sport, that really floated my boat. I thought that was incredible. But how these questions hit you is so different. About a year later, my father died. So the questions came up again. Then my mother came up to me and said, I can't afford to keep you at Millfield any longer. What are you going to do with your life? Thankfully, the teachers were fantastic. The coach was brilliant. They did a pincer movement, persuaded me I could go to American University on a scholarship. Quite interesting thing for a dyslexic at the time. Um, I got out there, and at 19, I got my first ever international for Great Britain, my first ever cap. And it wasn't just an international, it was the Montreal Olympic Games. And if you could imagine it, first day, first event of the swimming, pretty much the first heat of the swimming, I'm walking down the side of the pool feeling good. Her Majesty the Queen walks in as I get uh, level with a block. I can't believe it. And I get up onto the block, dive in, touch the end, and in front of the Queen, not only have I won my heat, but broken the Olympic record. Yes! That night I got through the semi-finals to the finals, and in the finals, my problems really started. Because you're marshaled to this room. It's called the call room. They've done away with it because it's so pressured, actually. It's this teeny box of glass, double glazed, one-way glass. You can see out, nobody can see in. Two TV monitors clearly showing you, what you uh, what's going on outside. Gold medals being won, lost, and presented. And you're marshaled into this room, and the door closes hermetically, and the silence begins, the most profound silence you've ever heard in your life. And you've got the seven... Gods, the lions of your sport in the room. And the marshal starts reading out the names. And they, the names came out, the lions. And then it came to me, Duncan Goodhue. And I went, who, who, me? I'm from West Sussex. I spill soup down my tie. I trip over my shoelaces. I'm fallible the day I'm long. Why me? Why me? There are Billions of people on this planet. Why should I be in this room with the seven fastest people in the world? I didn't win. I felt rather bad in that room. Now, it did actually uh, make me ask a few questions. What was I really trying to do? Well, my Olympic event is quite simple. It's one minute in four years, and somebody else picked the minute. So how do you get around this? How do you work around this position of performance? And I put my mind to this, and I thought, well, OK, uh, I'll look around. And the breakthrough came when I was presented, well, asked to be captain of the team. And I looked around, and there were loads of people, and loads of my teammates who were having bad days all the time in workouts. And I, I looked a bit closer, and I said, why are they having these bad days, all these bad workouts? And after a little time, I realized that they had other problems outside of the pool. They had relationship problems, you know, work problems, you name it. It was slopping in the pool. 
And I thought, well, if that's happening to them, it's happening to me. So I started working my hardest on my worst days. And you know what? Halfway through the workouts, there'd be a flip. There'd be an emotional flip followed by a, a real sense of euphoria where the physical performance would actually outstrip the good days. Soon my teammates and my coaches would say, he never has a bad day. And then, of course, the press got hold of it and my competitors got hold of it. Because how could I have a bad day? Because I couldn't afford a bad hour, because I couldn't afford a bad minute. Now, the physical bit was taken care of, but how do you get the head in the right zone to deal with something like that? And I thought about it, and eventually I came up with a solution. The problem is walking into the, that little call room, or any situation in life where you want to win gold, it suddenly feels odd. It feels new. And when it feels new and odd, what is your, uh, what is your response? What are your physiological responses to that? Do you want to charge forward or do you want to step back? Do you want to go for the food or do you want to run away from the lion and the bear? And the response there is who me, why me? So how do you get rid of this? And I thought, well, I've got to make it normal. I've got to make it as normal as getting out of bed and brushing your hair. Whoops, I don't do that. Okay, get out of bed and brushing my teeth. How do you make it normal? So I started a program of visualization followed by almost like emotionalization where I'd swim the perfect race, the perfect time, and I'd do it again and again. I'd sit watching myself do it, and then I'd try and imagine what it felt like to win win Olympic gold. And it all kind of pulled together. And I, I went into that room in Moscow, had a plan. The door shut from the earlier speech. Thank goodness, nothing hit me in the face. And then I wandered over, and everybody's, oh, I'm bigger than you, I'm stronger than you. And I sat down on the floor in the corner, like this. And I noticed everybody glancing at me. And I casually then took the book out of my pocket, opened the book. It was a Wilbur Smith. I'm not a big reader. I turned it the right way around. I had the presence of mind to do that. <laughs> and I started reading the book. It worked a treat. My adrenaline levels sank down. I was really calm. And over the top of my book, I saw something phenomenal happening. The glance rate was too much. The seven lions were glancing at me too often. And I could almost see the, the, the comic bubble coming out of the side of their head. Like this. He's reading a book. Why is he reading a book? Doesn't he know what's going on out there? He's reading a book. And I thought, this is great. All I have to do is tie my swimsuit and I've won. Went out there, dived in, 25 meters to go. The proverbial chimp on the shoulder yelled at me. In fact, I think it was a gorilla at the time. If you don't do something right now, you're not going to win. I couldn't believe the audacious, the supreme beauty of the answer. Not so. It was the work that went into it. And that's totally absurd. I touched the end, grabbed the blocks, held it there, and it was like I was drowning in my own emotions because my whole life went before my eyes. And in that moment, all the people who had been with me on that journey to win gold were with me. They're the ones that had helped me. They're the ones that had actually answered the questions. Who me? Why me? with, why not me? <laughs>